Just a very brief introduction, since you probably don't know very much about Novagen, I thought I'd just, in the next couple of slides, just very briefly introduce our history and, and, and what it is that we've sort of traditionally done. Um, it's, uh, we are a publicly listed uh, company, and up to now the company has really been devoted to researching new cancer, anti-cancer molecules, basically. That's been the, uh, the history of the, of the company. And um, some 24 years ago, our CEO was working at the University of Sydney on this molecule here, genistin, which originates from um, soy uh, products. And it was based on um, a bit of a, a, a flare of interest at the time in, um, in, in the um, epidemiological observation that uh, Asian populations tend to suffer less from uh, particularly cancer, but also other diseases such as heart disease. They, they seem to have less, but when those populations move to Western countries, start adopting Western diets, they tend to accumulate much more of the Western diseases. So that would uh, indicate that there's some sort of dietary influence here. And that's kicked off a whole area of research into these um, soy products. So that's the originating pharmacophore, but since then there's been development of a huge number of drug compounds through the adaptation of that molecule <coughs> into various different streams. And one of the ones that's been exploited um, is in anti-cancer and that's allowed Novagen to develop a whole range of molecules which we call um, benzopyrans. That's the, this structure is a benzopyran molecule, but we've developed more complicated structures and that's created a whole library of compounds. Now, in terms of the uh, cancer activity, this is just one example of the things we've been doing recently with these superbenzopyran compounds. That's led to the isolation of a compound that is looking extremely promising as a treatment for ovarian cancer. And one of the problems with um, ovarian cancer is that it's often treatable with the um, drugs such as cisplatin, that's the regular um, treatment for ovarian cancer. But after a while, the, the, the cancer will often come back and uh, then it becomes a very different disease. It becomes a recurrent disease, and it's much more difficult to treat because the cancer cells are now resistant to the drugs we use, use first time around. So this is a model of ovarian cancer um, that has already been treated. It's taken from human patients. Those cells have been taken from human patients, put into a mouse, and we're attempting to treat that recurrent disease. And we're very encouraged to find that in mice, this is, a, this is an X-ray of a mouse, and these red patches here indicate tumor. These mice have been treated equally. They've been injected with the um, um, same number of cells and then we're put on one of our compounds and we can see that it's now, it, it is very effective against these. Um, so this, these are the sort of applications that we're, we're developing with our, with, our, with, with our SBPs. But the, it became very obvious to us that if we go back to that originating genistin molecule that there is many more opportunities than just in cancer. And that is basically because genistin um, is, is, a, is a chemical that is capable of, it has what we call pleiotropic mechanisms. It means it can do an awful lot of different things. That, in one way, that makes that extremely complicated because it's often difficult to understand exactly how the mechanism works. But in the other way, it presents an opportunity because we can isolate those different pleiotropic properties and their biological action by screening and by using um, systems that allow us to identify those different, those different mechanisms of action. So I just want to focus on FSHD now. So we, I'm going to explain in a minute why we think these isoflavones, these, these um, the genistin molecules, have promising biological effects relevant to FSHD. Genistin itself is a very poor drug. It doesn't work. So um, it's been dismissed some years ago as a, as a potential drug for various different reasons. But we're producing novel isoflavones that are more active than genistin, and we, um, we are isolating those various different individual functions that it has. And the way we do this really is through this process of um, uh, pharmacological research called quantitative structure activity relationship analysis. And the idea essentially is that you take um, cells such as the ones that um, Leslie has produced with those, those myotubes, we put on the compound. If we find an indication of beneficial effect, then we, then we isolate those particular compounds that were effective and we make very similar ones, and then we go back and we ask the question again, have we improved it, have we made it worse? And you do that in a cyclical process until you try and enrich and enhance the activity that you've isolated. Now, coming on to the, the, the mechanism of FSHD, and I really don't need to cover this at all because Stephen has done this beautifully, so, so I, I, I can ignore these next two slides, but just to remind you obviously that the, the disease is caused by the contraction of these repeats leading to ducts for expression. And this is just a review of the, um, 
of the various pathways that have been implicated in the, in the downstream consequences of Dux4 expression um, and that have been implicated. And I want to focus today particularly on the potential for our compounds to inhibit um, Dux4 expression. That is our supreme hope because as Stephen explained, that would be the guarantee of a cure essentially, that if you could inhibit Dux4. But I also want to talk about a couple of other opportunities that we have that are b because of Genistein's known properties. And one is the um, sensitivity to oxidative stress, which is, seems to be a characteristic feature of FSHD, and also the differentiation defect, which has been implicated as an important part of the, of the process. So just to remind you what um, Leslie said, she's generated these cell lines. We know that they're expressing Dux4. And we know the consequences of um, expression of Dux4 lead to these particular phenotypic readouts, which are um, reduced myotube length, um, reduced fusion index, reduced average diameter, and reduced maximal diameter. So these are clear readouts that we can use. This is all done by, I should say, all done by high content. There's been no human involvement in this. This is all just done by a machine. So there's no bias introduced. It's all, you know, it, it, it's all uh, scientifically robust. We can put our compounds on, and what we would aim to do, obviously, is to improve these parameters over here to see if we can increase them back up to there, and that would be an indication that we were onto something. So high content screening is, um, is a system where essentially you've, uh, take, you, you grow the, I, I shouldn't be explaining this, Leslie should be doing this, but anyway, but the, uh, essentially what you're doing is uh, taking um, a, 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 a culture plate which has um, 96 wells you're using, I don't think. You're using 384, okay, so using 384, 384 individual wells in which each of those wells contains um, a group of cells that are differentiating into myotubes, and then the compound is put on in a replicated way at different concentrations, and then that is read by a machine, and those individual measurements that are being made here of diameter, et cetera, are being read by a machine, and then that spits out the data and we can, uh, can analyze. Is that reasonably clear? Yeah. Um, so let's, let's come on to this mechanism of action for why we think um, Dux4 um, ought to be, re be repressed by uh, these genistin-related molecules. So um, this is a bit of evidence that came out in 2006, which uh, is very interesting, and it's, it, it summarizes some indications that have been around for a while that uh, genistin-related compounds seem to have utility or, or activity in epigenetic repression, and this is exactly the mechanism that um, that is causing the problem in, the, in, in, in Dux4. Um, this, this experiment really elegantly demonstrates that um, because it uses a mouse indicator strain where there's a particular gene that has become unstable due to the insertion of a DNA element just up, up, upstream of that, um, of that region. And it, you get variable expression of that gene leads to a coat color phenotype. This is called the agouti viable yellow system. Now, all of these mice are all genetically identical. The only difference is that the epigenetic control mechanisms regulating that gene that I was talking about have become unstable. And so sometimes it's on and sometimes it's off. And these mice have been given genistin in their embry when they're in embryos. And what happens is that the, it shifts the phenotype towards the agouti phenotype. So if the, if the gene is is, is on, you get a yellow mouse and it's rather obese. If the gene is off, it's a gooty and it's much slimmer. So by feeding them genistin, what's happened is that it's shifted it much more towards the agouti, suggesting that that AVY allele has been silenced much more regularly in this case. So the, um, the, the point that this makes in, the, in relation to FSHD is that in, in, we're not talking about individual mice here, we're talking about individual cells. The, the problem with the FSHD is not every, not every muscle cell, as it's differentiating, expresses the Dux4. It's only a subset of the cells. And in fact, from Stephen's paper um, published a few years ago, he demonstrated that it's only about one in a thousand cells that are actually expressing the Dux4. So if we can reduce that number even further, then you would hopefully um, inhibit the progress of the disease and hopefully even silence it completely. Now, the, the, the second set of mechanisms I want to talk about is to do with the downstream processing, and this is, this is the oxidative stress side of things. So 
for a number of years it's been, it's been known that um, you can find markers of oxidative stress in, 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 in tissue sections of muscle. This is a transverse section of muscle tissue from a control and from an FSHD patient. And you find this deposition of lipofusion, which is an indicator of oxidative stress. We also know from some work that was supported by FSHD Global that, um, that uh, a screen that was done against myoblasts that were overexpressing DUX4 um, as, a, as, a, as a screening tool that uh, when, when Michael Kyber screened 44,000 small drug-like molecules and looked for activity that would, um, uh, that would improve the, the, the health of those cells, that was a toxicity assay, um, he found that um, a, a large number of compounds seemed to be active uh, and were anti-toxic and uh, 52 of those compounds he, he demonstrated in his paper. And there doesn't seem to be much chemical relationship between the drugs that were isolated in this, in this screen, but nevertheless, 60% of them, he, he noted in the paper, um, showed antioxidant acti activity. Again, su suggesting that, that antioxidants are an important part of the disease process. And finally, as Leslie uh, mentioned a minute ago, the Genea microarray screen on the FSHD myotubes are also showing increased expression of oxidative stress markers at that very early stage of myotube development. So again, that's another reason for thinking this might be a very important mechanism of action. Now, we do know that genistin-related compounds, as part of this pleiotropic um, suite of, of, of activities, we, we know that they, 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 they are very active as antioxidants, not just as free radical scavengers um, from direct protection from oxidative stress, but also they activate two very important pathways that the cell has of coping with oxidative stress. One of those is called PPAR gamma, PPAR gamma pathway, and the other one is called the NRF2 pathway, which activates these uh, nuclear genes that are uh, uh, that, 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 uh, called the, uh, the, the, all these genes contain this antioxidant response element, and that's part of the, the, the way in which the cell responds itself to, to, um, to uh, oxidative damage. Now finally, the, the third mechanism I just want to mention very briefly, and this is really nothing to do with the work that's being funded by um, FSHD Global. This is a separate experiment that we're doing anyway. We're interested in the potential for our drugs to control, um, uh, to control myoblast proliferation and also regenerative properties. And that's really from an observation that came out a few years ago where when we were looking at those ovarian cancer stem cells that I was talking about, we found that when we were treating with our SBPs, um, we got a nice killing effect of the cells as we would expect. This is no drug, but at very low drug doses, we found we actually increased the proliferation of those stem cells. And therefore, there is the potential to actually improve proliferation and regenerative properties of, of normal stem cells rather than, than, in this case, ovarian cancer stem cells. And we're looking at that through, again, through a Genia collaboration that's entirely funded by Novagen to see if we can find any utility in that mechanism. And if there is, then that would be applicable to FSHD. But as I mentioned, this is, this is not, part of the, um, not part of the grant funded um, application that we've put in. So in summary, um, what I told you is that Genia biocells have a high quality model of FSHD disease, which you, you all know very well because you've been supporting it for a number of years. Um, that we have a robust theoretical rationale for use of the genistin-based compounds against the FSHD disease mechanism, and we uh, have a collaborative screen of SBP co compounds against the Genia biocells model will, is beginning very shortly. Uh, we're just working out the technical details now. And if we do get positive results from that, that will uh, trigger this QSAR refinement process and development to the next phase, which would obviously involve mouse models and then ultimately clinical trials. And, um, and that's it for me. And I just want to thank once again the FSHD uh, Global Foundation for the, the support of that work.